Well, today we're continuing our series, Prayer and Listening. And in this series, we're discovering how listening to God, listening to Him speak to us, prepares us to pray prayers that are according to His will, prayers that will get answered. Now, this morning we're going to talk about praying persistently. Now, as we've gone through this series, we've discovered several conditions for our prayers being answered. First of all, we must pray according to God's will. Uh, If we pray just simply the things we want, and it's not God's will, guess what? God's not going to answer those. Just like uh, the child that wants ice cream for breakfast, and mom and dad say, no, he's not going to get that. That's not in the parent's will. So God has a will for us as well. If we pray and ask for things that is not in his will for us, the answer is going to be no. So we must pray according to God's will. Secondly, we must pray in faith. James tells us we need to pray in faith. We need to believe that God's going to answer the prayers that we pray. If we doubt, we're not going to receive answers to our prayers. And thirdly, our topic today is we must pray persistently. We must keep on praying until the answer comes. If we stop praying, then our prayer will not be answered. First Thessalonians 5.17, and I encourage you to take out the white page in the middle of your bulletin. It has the scriptures written out there for you, as well as the outline. It says, pray continually. Other translations say, pray without ceasing, or pray constantly, or never stop praying. Now, what does it mean to, to pray continually? It means to be in constant communication with God. I mean, how many of you talk to yourself? A few of you do. Uh, We tend to talk to ourselves. We need to talk to God all the time, not just to ourselves. Talk to God, listen to what God is saying to us, asking Him for guidance and direction. Not just on Sunday mornings, but during the week. You're on the job. God, what should I do? How should I do this? God, I don't know how to do this. Help me figure out how to do what I'm supposed to do. Should I talk to this person? God, what should I say to this person? Constant communication with God. That's what it means to pray continually. Ephesians 6.18 says, pray in the Spirit. As I read through this verse, you might want to circle all the words that are all uh, in this verse. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Be this in mind and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And so this verse expands on what it means to pray continually. Our prayer should be in the Spirit. It means whether they're prayed in English or whether they're prayed in another tongue, they should be in the Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we are to pray for all of God's people. We are to pray for other believers that we know in the church family. And I believe this includes praying for people who are not yet God's people, who God has destined to be His people. Praying for people who are lost, that they would come to Him and become part of the family of God. Luke 18, verse 1, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Always pray and not give up. Now, why do you think Jesus told this parable? Because people tend to not always pray, and they tend to give up. They tend to stop praying before the answer comes, and then they don't receive the answer. Now, the parable that Jesus told here, we don't have time to read it, but he told a a parable about an unjust judge and a widow. And this widow came to this unjust judge to receive justice from him in her case. The exact details of the case uh, were not mentioned. They're not important to the story. And at first, the judge ignored the widow. So I'll just get away. I, I don't have time for you. This is not an important case. And she kept coming back to the judge time and time again. I need justice, God. I need justice, judge. And please give me justice. And finally, the judge just got worn out. He thought, you know, I've got other things to do. Let me just give this widow what she wants, and then she's going to go away. And so he gave the widow the the justice she asked for because she persisted in asking him over and over again. And Jesus closes the parable in verse 7 and 8, and he says, And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And so Jesus says that if this unjust judge is going to grant the 
request of this widow, how much more will our Heavenly Father in Heaven answer our prayers? When we do what? When we cry out to Him day and night. Now that sounds like pretty intense prayer, doesn't it? Crying out to God day and night for the things that we ask of Him. And Jesus ends with the question of whether He will find faith on the earth when He returns. Now, why would he say that? Why is he talking about faith when he returns? It's because faith and persistence in prayer are integrally related. If you have faith, then you're going to persist in praying until the answer comes. Why? Because you believe if you keep on praying, the answer is going to come. Now, if you give up in praying, why would you give up? You give up because you've lost faith. You don't believe it's, it's doing anything. Your prayer is not being answered, and so you quit praying. And that happens oftentimes when the answer doesn't come quickly. We want things instant. We want microwave prayers. We just pop it in, and a few minutes later, we want the answer. But oftentimes, our answer is delayed. It comes in God's timing. When it's delayed, that's when we're challenged. Are we going to persist in prayer? Are we going to keep on believing as we pray? Or are we going to stop believing and give up praying? Now today, as last week, we're going to focus on prayers for people who are not yet saved, for lost people, people who are our friends, people who are our relatives, co-workers, neighbors, and schoolmates. But the, the principles we're talking about, about prayer, applies to any kind of request you might have. But we're going to focus on the topic of of praying for lost people. Now, it's God's will to save people. We talked about that last week. And so we must persistently pray in faith until God breaks through and, and their eyes become open to the truth of the gospel and they give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. So how can we learn to pray persistently? First of all, we must make a decision to be persistent. Jesus said in Luke 11, Nine, he said, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Now again, these are, this is a conclusion to another story that Jesus told about being persistent in prayer. And in this story, a man went to a friend's house at midnight because he needed a loaf of bread to serve a stranger who had come to visit him. And so he went to the friend's house at midnight. Now, back then as now, most people will be asleep at midnight. And so he began to knock on the man's door. And the friend yelled from inside, go away, we're already in bed. This is not appropriate, just go away. And the guy kept knocking and the friend told him to go away again. And he knocked and knocked and finally the guy got up opened the door because he wasn't getting any sleep anyhow and gave him what he wanted, gave him a loaf of bread. And so this man had persisted in knocking until his request was answered. And in the same way, we must choose to persist in our prayers. Now, God is not like the man saying, go away. But God has a time. He has a perfect time and situation for our prayers to be answered. And we need to keep Praying until that time comes. Praying for people who don't know Jesus Christ until they come to know him. So why do we sometimes have trouble in being persistent? It's why we become weary. So God tells us don't become weary in Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And so when we pray for some time, no matter what the the request may be about, and we don't see an answer, we're tempted to become tired of praying. Now, of course, we need to keep in mind that sometimes the prayers we pray are not in accordance with God's will. And then God does give us an answer, and the answer is no. And if God tells us no, uh, then we can stop praying. And so we need to discern whether what we're praying is in the will of God or not. But praying for people who are lost is always in God's will that they be saved. We talked about that last week. And so here, when we pray for something and we don't see the answer come right away, 
Uh, we have a, a friend, we have a relative, we're praying for them, and yet they seem very resistant to the gospel. They just don't want anything to do with it. We're tempted to become tired of praying. We're tempted to want to give up, and yet God's word here commands us, don't grow weary, don't give up. Because in God's time, the prayer will be answered. You see, prayer, prayer is kind of like planting seeds in the ground. Now, if you plant, my wife is, is growing some flowers, and you plant the seeds, and at first, the little pot she had in it, there's nothing was happening. Now, I was tempted just to throw them out. Hey, it's not working. Okay, you put the seeds in there, nothing's coming up. Just wait. You know, we're watering, there's water in them, and look, there's nothing happening. But eventually, you know, a little sprout pops up. Now, it doesn't look like much. It's not pretty. It's just a kind of a yellow-green little sprout. My wife, Carol, has faith that one day it's going to be a beautiful flower. And so she keeps tending it. And prayer is kind of like that. It's like planting seeds, and it takes time for those seeds of our prayers to grow up until... What does this verse say? Until the time comes to reap the harvest. If we don't give up in prayer, if we remain persistent, we're going to reap a harvest. And in the, in the topic we're focusing on today, that harvest will be people being saved and brought into the family of God. We need to rely on God's strength rather than becoming weary. Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 4.13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength, and the him is God. And so this verse is God's promise that when we are doing God's work, when we are doing things according to God's will, then he'll give us the strength. He'll help us to persist until we complete it. And so when it seems as though our strength is not enough, when we're tempted to give up, when we're tempted to become weary, we need to rely on God and ask him to give us the strength to be persistent in our prayers, that the lost would be saved until those prayers are answered. Now, my wife's Carol's parents were not, my wife's Carol's father was not raised by Christian parents. Uh, they thought they were Christian, uh, they were Catholic, but they, they had no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They thought being a Christian simply meant going to church every week and uh, doing the Mass and different things they did. And so when Carol was in middle school, her parents became believers in Jesus Christ. They, uh, people witnessed to them, and they understood the truth of the gospel. They gave their hearts to Jesus Christ and began attending a Bible-believing church. And the whole family then began to pray for Carol's grandparents to be saved. And they prayed for them for years and years, and nothing happened. In fact, for a long time, the grandparents would not even talk to Carol's parents because they had left the church that they had been raised in. And that was like an unthinkable thing to do. And late in life, both grandparents grew terminally ill, and they were close to passing on. And in both cases, a... a pastor from a Bible-believing church went to pray with them in the hospital. And in their last weeks on this earth, they both prayed and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so persistence in prayer over many, many years saw the answer come in the last days. And I believe that one day we'll see them in heaven. And how did that happen? Because of prayer over many, many years. Not only must you be persistent in prayer, we must learn to accept God's burden. Psalm 126 says, Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. And so to take up praying for the lost is to is to take up the burden of their eternal destiny, to care enough about a person that you're going to pray for them, you're going to persist in prayer, even with tears, until the answer comes. And if you listen to God carefully, He's going to place a burden on your heart to pray for the salvation of certain people. Now, you know, you can't pray for the whole world. 
Hey, there's billions of people in the world. You, you, you can't do it. You can't pray for everybody in St. Louis. You can't pray for everybody in Fenton or Baldwin or Chesterfield. We, we can't do it. We just don't have that capacity. But God is going to put certain people's heart, certain people on your heart, certain people that he wants you to pray for. And the burden that God places on your heart will often be for the people who are closest to you, obviously, right? If you have relatives, if you have grandparents, if you have grandchildren, if you have children, if you have spouses that are not yet saved, then most likely God is going to put them on your heart to pray for that they would be saved and come to faith in Jesus Christ. And as you accept that burden from God, he's going to motivate you to pray persistently for their salvation. When we pray, we need to pray with passion. We already talked about crying out to God, sowing in tears. Romans 10.1 says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. This is Apostle Paul writing. He was an Israelite. He was a Jew. I guess I need to say that the, the Jews aren't saved by being Jews. Jesus came as their Messiah, and they need to accept him as their Messiah and be saved just as Gentiles, who's everybody who's not a Jew, are saved by believing in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And so Paul was praying for the Jews to be saved. He had a great passion for his countrymen to come to faith in Jesus Christ. He continued to pray that they would be saved, and many were through his ministry. But his prayers were not just doing something that he knew he should do. God had placed a desire in his heart. And that desire was from God. And he fanned that desire into flame as he prayed day in and day out. And his prayers were answered. In fact, his desire was so intense that he writes early in Romans, he says, he could wish himself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of his people, the Israelites. I can't fathom somebody writing that. I, I could not say that. I don't know if that we're really called to say that. But that was the depth of his desire that the, his fellow Israelites, his fellow Jews would be saved. And so we need to pray with deep passion and conviction as we pray for the lost. Not only should we pray, we need to witness boldly as well. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul writes, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And so prayer by itself is important, it's essential, but it's, it's rarely the end of the story. Most often, when we have God's burden, when we're praying passionately for somebody close to us to be saved, God is going to direct us to take some kind of action. You know, it's not just us going to the prayer closet and praying in private and never doing anything else. That's important. That's essential. But oftentimes, God will direct you to witness to the people you're praying for. Oftentimes, well, God will direct you to do something kind, uh, something helpful to the people you're praying for to show his love to them, to show that you care about them, to pray for them in other needs that they may have in life. If they're sick, do you care? you're praying for their salvation, do you care enough to pray for their healing? God would have us to pray for them in all kinds of ways, directing us to witness to them with both our words and actions as we pray for them as well. And so our witness... The words that we speak that's backed by hours and days and months or years of prayer is going to be far more effective than if we hadn't prayed at all. And so as we pray for people to be saved, open your ears to hear what God may be saying to you about words that you should speak, invitations that you should give, prayers that you should pray in their presence. It's all about accepting God's burden and compassion for the lost. I read a story about a woman named a woman named Chrissy who was awakened by a phone call late at night. She answered the phone and it was her brother on the line. 
And he said, he shouted to her on the phone. He said, sis, I've invited Jesus Christ into my life. I'm saved. The preacher told me to tell somebody immediately, so I'm calling you in the middle of the night because you've been praying for me for so long. You see, Chrissy's brother was as far from God as anybody could be. And Chrissy was just shocked when he called her. You see, at her mother's funeral, she thought it would be a time to share Jesus with her brother, and he screamed at her as to get away as she tried to share the gospel with him. This brother had broken up a pastor's home to marry his third wife. He'd been antagonistic to the things of God for years and years, and yet his sister Chrissy had prayed for him all those years long, and somehow her prayers had finally been answered. God had broken through that hard heart, and he'd committed his life to Jesus Christ. The captive had been set free, and so God wants to do the same for us. It's no accident that all these stories, these true stories, including personal stories, it took years. It's no accident. Now, we wish it would take weeks. We wish it would take months, and sometimes that happens. But oftentimes it takes years of prayer before God breaks through. We should pray for new children of God. John 1.12 says, To all who received him, that's Jesus, to who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so when a person receives Jesus Christ into their life, by believing on, in him, they become a child of God. They are become part of the family of God. They are born again. Now, that's a phrase that gets tossed around, and Jesus said, you must be born again. What does that mean? Well, each of us physically is born out of our mother's womb the first time. And when a person believes in Jesus Christ and trusts their life to him, they are born again. Again, they are born a second time spiritually into the family of God. They become a child of God. I mean, we're a child of our physical parents. Everybody is, but not everybody is a child of God. Not everybody has been born again, born from above. And so as we pray for people to be saved, we're actually praying that they will be born into God's family as a new child of God. Now, you and I cannot cause a person to be born again. We can't argue a person into being born again. It, it is a work of the Holy Spirit. And so as we pray for people to be saved, we need to ask for the Spirit to work. Titus 3.5 is one of many verses that talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. It says, He saved us, speaking of God, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And so people are born again through the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the one that causes a person to be born again, to be saved. Now the Spirit works in a number of ways to draw people to Jesus Christ. First of all, we need to pray for the Spirit to bring conviction of sin. Because if a person doesn't think they've done anything wrong, I mean, what are you saved from? Uh, you're saved from your sin. You're saved from the wrong things that you've done. And so a person must be convicted of sin that they've done wrong things, and, and they need to be convicted enough to repent, to turn away from those wrong things and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that is one of the works of the Holy Spirit. And so we pray for conviction of sin, repentance, and also that the person would have the gift of faith so that they could believe in a God they can't see. So they could believe in a heaven and a hell that they can't see. So they can believe the truth of God's word, the spiritual truth, and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And it's then that the Spirit makes that person, the Bible says, a new creation. It's at that point the person becomes born again. It's at that point that the Spirit of God begins to live inside of them. And they become a child of God a member of God's very own family. And so as we pray for people, we ask the Spirit to work. Now, as we pray, we must also fill our minds and our mouths with words of faith, declaring God's word in faith. Ezekiel 37, verse 4 and 5, prophet Ezekiel uh, 
Well, the book says, then he said to me, God speaking to the prophet Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, bones, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to lie. And so in these verses, Ezekiel is, is seeing a vision and in this vision, he sees a valley of dry bones, dead, dry bones. And he's commanded by God to speak life into those bones, that they would come together and flesh would come on them and they would come to life. And so spiritually, a person far from God is spiritually like dry bones. There is no life of God in them. And we need to speak words of faith that the Spirit of God would come into their lives and make those dry bones live again. And so as we pray for those who are not yet saved, our words, even to ourselves, must be in faith. You know, what would be words that would not be in faith? This person will never come to God. They're too far gone. I can't believe they're... I, that's not faith. That's going to undermine any prayers that you're praying for them. Words of faith that you speak even to yourself. God, as I pray this prayer, I believe you're working in their lives. I can't see anything happening on the surface, but I know you're working. And I believe as I continue to pray that you're going to continue to work and draw that person to yourself. When you speak to other people, are you speaking words of faith? Are you saying, look, look what that person is doing. They, they don't go to church. They're living a life of sin. They could care less about the things of God. Or are you talk to other people and say, I'm praying for them. I believe God's working in their life. And look for signs of God working in their life. Speak words of faith. Prophesy in faith that God will bring salvation in his time. We must declare God's word in faith for those that we are praying for. Another story about praying for lost people. There was a woman named Pam. Her mother died. It made Pam think about eternity and whether she was prepared for eternity or not. And she gave her life back to God and began to pray for her brother, a brother named O'Brien who'd strayed far from the faith of his mother. O'Brien had been in the military. He was stationed in, in Asia. He ended up marrying a Buddhist for a wife. Pam continued to pray, even though that was not too encouraging. And she asked God to break, through the Holy Spirit, to break bondages in her brother's life and to bring him to himself. She prayed for two years. And finally, she heard from her brother. He had found the Lord overseas. And he was going to follow Jesus. And he came with his Buddhist wife, came to visit Pam. And when... They were at the house. She shared the gospel with his wife. And his wife gave her heart to the Lord as well. Two new spiritual children were birthed into the family of God through Pam's prayer for her brother and his unbelieving wife over several years. It's a wonderful mystery of how God works through our prayers and the Holy Spirit to bring people to salvation. You and I can't save anybody, no matter how hard you try. And I have tried to argue people into believing. And I felt I won the arguments. But they'll end up saying, I just don't believe you. It's like, look, I proved it. So I don't believe you. I'm going. Bye. See ya. You know, they don't want to hear anymore. You can't argue people into the kingdom of God. We can't save another person, no matter how hard we try. And yet, God will not save anyone, I don't believe, without the participation of believers in prayer. I believe everybody that's saved, somebody somewhere was praying. And that salvation is a result of prayers of believers. Through prayer, we can partner with God to birth spiritual children. We're going to be part of the family of God with us forever and ever. And one day in heaven, we're going to meet the people that we prayed for who became believers as a consequence of our prayers and the prayers of other people. And so in order to see the lost saved, we must pray persistently 
until the answer comes. We mustn't grow weary. We rely on God to be our strength. We accept God's burden, and he'll put a burden on your heart for different people to pray for them. Why? Because we care about them. We, we love them. We want them to have the relationship with God that we have in this life. And we want them to spend eternity with God in heaven as well. We pray for people to be born into God's family through the work of the Holy Spirit. We speak words of faith, both to ourselves and to others. And we agree with other believers. It's wonderful we, when we can pray together for someone to be saved. And we can do that in our life groups and other times when you meet with other believers. And as we keep on praying, it may be hard. We may be sowing our prayers in tears at times, but one day we're going to reap with joy. We're going to reap a harvest that's going to impact eternity. And what are we praying for people? We're praying that they would be saved. How does a person become saved? First of all, they need to A, admit that they've sinned. They've done wrong things. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Secondly, you need to believe that Jesus died on the cross, took our sins upon himself, and paid the penalty for our sins that we might be forgiven. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can be forgiven of the sins that we have done, the sins that doom us to eternity apart from God in hell. We must believe in Jesus Christ, that he's alive today, and commit our lives to following him as our Lord and Savior. Those are the three essential things we or anybody must do to be saved. Let's bow our heads right now. We're going to pray. If you'd like to commit your life to Jesus Christ for the first time this morning, you'd like to recommit your life to him, I'd encourage you to pray with me. Perhaps you, you once prayed a prayer like this years ago and you've wandered away from God and today you want to come back to him. Then pray this prayer to recommit your life. Say, Father, today I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. I followed my own desires in life. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross that my sins might be forgiven. And he rose from the dead. I commit my life to following him as my Lord and Savior from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.